Hi, and welcome back to Coffee and Calacas. I'm your host, Joe. If you are new to this podcast, I want to welcome you and let you know that this is a weekly podcast where we sit around the coffee table, talk about mysticism, the supernatural, and what else lies in the beyond. So if you're interested, I hope you enjoyed this week's episode. Thank you. If you are listening to this on Spotify or watching this on YouTube, I want to go ahead and offer a trigger warning here. Um, This episode will talk about um, abuse and murder. So if this is something that does not interest you, I suggest that you stop watching right now or stop listening and um, stay tuned for next week's episode. Thank you. Okay, so this week we are going to dive in and... um, we're actually doing something kind of special this week, and we're going to do a little true crime. True crime. Um, I really hope you enjoy that. Um, happy Valentine's Day, first of all. Um, I mean, it's just either if you're watching this on Monday, it's Monday. Happy Valentine's Day. If you're watching this on Sunday, Saturday, um, well, happy Valentine's Day to you too. <laughs> um, if this is a, like I said, this is going to be a special I mean, normally we do talk about true crime. I mean, um, you know, stories of the supernatural, not necessarily true crime, but um, this story relates to the city of Brownsville. And um, as I have mentioned before, it's one of those things that um, that I do like to to incorporate things that have happened in Brownsville or around Brownsville, whether it's in the Rio Grande Valley area, um, maybe even Mexico, Matamoros, you know, um, Reynosa. But this 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 story actually happened in Brownsville, and um, I actually, I mean, years ago, I mean, maybe three four years ago, I had a co- a coworker who, um, I'm not even sure how the conversation got started, but you know, she actually told me this this uh, actual um story, and it was something that kind of like stuck in the back of my mind, and when I was thinking about true crime stories of Brownsville, which is something that I kind of wanted to incorporate you know, every now and then, um, it, you know, I, I thought of it and I said, you know what, this is a really good thing to talk about. Um, but yeah, it's something different. Um, I really hope you enjoy this as much as I enjoyed, you know, um, researching it now. Yeah. The, the research on this is a little bit limited, but what I did find was enough for, for an episode. And, um, I really hope you enjoy what I'm going to present to you today. Now, because of Valentine's Day, um, you know, I was just thinking about, um, I guess, couples who are in love. And just the other day, I was out at a um, coffee shop and, you know, I saw some young couple and, you know, they were, you know, you could tell they were very much in love. And I'm like, oh, how cute. You know, like, it's nice to see young love. Um, you know, not, not everyone's, uh, I guess, out to get each other and stuff. And it was, it was very refreshing to see them, you know, they looked very happy and, you know, they were sharing, um, you know, I'm not sure it was coffee, you know, what they were sharing, but they were, they were sharing something and I thought, oh, how nice, how sweet. And, you know, uh, really, you know, just thought about Valentine's Day and what that's coming up and, or that it is, I'm not even sure, but yeah, I was thinking about it and, and. I said, you know what, I want to do something that has to do with love, but, you know, again, also not too cheesy, right? Um, yeah, so what it says love like murder, right? Um, not necessarily that, you know, you, you want to murder someone, but I mean, there's, I mean, no, I mean, not every murder, because I mean, some murders just happen just for the, you know, for the heck of it. I mean, but, you know, you, some of the best murders to talk about, I guess you could say, um, are sometimes crimes of passion. And what I'm presenting to you today is something that really stuck out with me. Um, so this is a story of Scott and Tracy Rohde. Okay. So like I said, um, a coworker actually talked to me about this first. And I did a little bit of research and it was so it was something that was in the back of my mind. And as I'm seeing, you know, people in love and you know, drinking coffee together. I'm like, that's, that's nice, you know? And, and then it, I don't know, somehow 
my mind works in mysterious ways and it 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 uh struck a chord and I remembered this and I said, you know what, this is something to talk about. So I can seriously picture myself sitting down with someone chatting and you know discussing the story and um you know so why not bring up my coffee you know lovers here and you know so sit back enjoy this you know sip on your coffee um you know if you're not drinking coffee whatever you're drinking enjoy this while i you know dive in and talk to you about scott and tracy so scott and tracy were high school sweethearts um scott grew up in iowa and he was just a little bit older than than tracy um i think we about two two to three years older than her um tracy and him met in high school they started dating um they eventually you know um be, end up getting married they were actually married for 20 years which is pretty impressive if you ask me um scott was an engineer and he actually put himself through high um through college and tracy was actually a um a nurse and she had a specialty in labor and delivery yeah so that's pretty that's pretty awesome um so anyone who is out there who is a nurse congrats that's a very um difficult job not seeing an engineer isn't but to be a nurse first of all that you know you're you're a true hero and to deliver a baby that's that's impressive. I know taking care of taking care of babies is a lot of work. Um, so, if you are a nurse in the labor and delivery unit, congrats, high fives to you. And if you're an engineer, high five to you too. You know, you you earn something that not everyone does. I mean, I'm not an engineer. So yeah, um, they got married. I think around 1990, and um, in 1992 they had their first son. And in 93, they had their second, and in 95, they had the third, uh, their third boy. All um all her babies were boys. And you know, they they seem like an all-American family. And you know, up to this point, yeah, they they pretty much were, you know, um, they they had good jobs, you know, they were hard workers. Um, you know, nothing about them would you say, oh, you know, they're they're a little strange. No, they're they're good people. Okay. So Scott um you know late through the marriage i guess i mean tracy was beautiful you know she you know uh blonde blue you know blue eyes i believe if i remember her picture correctly um thin took care of herself you know like you could tell she you know she looked good okay and i guess scott kind of got a little bit jealous there and jealousy always rears its ugly head and it it does us no good you know um jealousy who, who does it help who does it help it helps no one you know but yeah so uh he started um getting a little you know ups- i wouldn't want to say obsessed but in her in her words yes um it it she he was kind of obsessed with her you know always needed to know her whereabouts um he he'd you know get upset with her if she wasn't home on time from work um that kind of situation and um he const because of his i guess his jealousy he was constantly lashing out at tracy and you know calling her a tramp a whore you know saying that she was sleeping around with the doctors or with the other nurses and you know just really putting her down and um you if you have been a victim of um of abuse of any kind i'm sorry like you know it, that takes a lot it you know someone can say oh why don't you just walk away it's not always easy to just walk away from something um whether it's financial you know if you're not in the financial position to walk away that's that's hard um if you are um if you feel threatened for your life you know because someone's telling you that they're gonna you know they're gonna chase after you and make your life you know hell that's it 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 puts you in a position where you feel you know like you're between a rock and a hard place so um don't go judging her for not walking away from this marriage um we don't know what was going on with her or what made her stay but she stuck around okay 
And sometimes it's just love. You know, you love a person so much that you really believe that, you know, they're going to change. And especially they, they tell you, hey, I'm going to change. I'm trying to change. And, you know, she said, you know, they, as much as they, they would fight, they would often have really good times. And that could be it. You know, maybe sometimes the good times would outweigh the bad times, but the, the bad times would just kind of stick out a little bit more. Right. So, yeah, um, she she often had problems with him and, you know, he'd come after her and saying, oh, Tracy, you know, you you're a whore. And, um, you know, uh, he kind of just put her down. So Tracy in, in an interview, um, actually, she she was asked something and, you know, he, she said in, in her interview that one time his I guess his jealousy was so bad that she went home and okay, came. Um, she worked late. She went home that night and no one was home. Her three boys were gone. He was gone and, you know, uh, no cars in the garage. It was quiet and, and it was late. So, I mean, I'm not sure exactly what late would mean to her, but I'm guessing maybe around like 11 at night. Okay. So um, she said that she had a long day at work and she had stayed late because I guess maybe a lot of laborers, you know, and deliveries that she was doing and you know, hey, you can't control life, right? So yeah, she gets home, no one's home. So she starts to panic because what, what happened, right? You know, were they in an accident? I just didn't know about it. So she starts making phone calls to, you know, the local hospitals. And um, she's like, you know, panicking because, you know, they don't have whereabouts about, about what happened. And at that moment, she hears the garage door opening. She runs outside or she runs to the garage and she sees, you know, the kids and him and she hugs him and she's like, oh my God, where were you? What happened? What happened? And his first thing, you know, was you tramp, you whore, where the hell have you been? And he just went off on her saying that he took the kids, he woke the kids or grabbed, grabbed the kids and took them to go look for her so they could see the kind of tramp that his, that their mom was. And it's like, bro, calm down. What the hell? The audacity of this man, you know, putting your kids in that position, first of all, no, don't, don't bring the kids into this, you know, it, they don't need to see anything. Okay. They should be held innocent as long as they can. They're kids. They are kids, you know? So yeah, like that was pretty rough all on its own. And yeah, he kind of just put her in a position where it's like, oh, well, you know, you're a whore. Well, your kids need to see that you're a whore. They don't need to see that. And she never actually gave him, you know, reason to believe that she was a whore. Um, so imagine in five years or in 13 years, they moved five times. They went from Tennessee to, I think, Missouri, Arkansas. They finally ended up in, in Brownsville, Texas. <laughs> this is where it comes in. So if you're from Brownsville, shout out to you guys. Um, yeah. So they end up in Brownsville and um, because... It wasn't just his jealousy that would pull them apart, but he kind of had this bit of a paranoia that his coworkers were out to sabotage him. So I guess, you know, that kind of messed with him um, mentally, you know, mental health wise, maybe he wasn't in the best place, maybe feeling a lot of stress from work, feeling stress in his relationship, feeling stress, and he would project and take it out on Tracy, you know, that's where the jealousy... I, I want to say that's where the jealousy would manifest. Um, yeah, I have psychology degree, so, uh, but I'm not doing a judgment here. I'm not, you know, this is, I'm not judging anyone, you know, it is what it is. Um, I also have a degree in counseling, but again, I don't counsel. Okay. It's just there. It's more for looks than anything else. Um, so if you are a counselor, tell me, what do you think? You know, do you think that his stress levels and whatever's going out on his exterior is um, causing him to, you know, project to his loved one? I mean, because honestly, I feel that's what it is. I really do. Um, yeah, so he, they moved uh, five times in 13 years. That to me, okay, I don't know. I've never moved. I've lived in the same place my whole life. So I don't know, but. To me, that's kind of a bit. That's that that's that's a lot. Um, so yeah, he he um you know they moved and they like I said, they finally ended up here in Brownsville, Texas. And in Brownsville, Texas, that is where she meets someone. Never had reason to give, you know, 
scot any you know uh like like oh hey i am cheating on you no like and not that she cheated on him okay but in texas she meets someone who she related to you know she was like hey i have a connection with you um and it was more on an emotional level you know her coworker, um who whose name is sean um they they bonded they you know he would talk to her and listen and you know she was able to you know como dicen se podía desahogar con él you know he he was able to talk to her and she just would vent and oh my god i love finding someone i could just vent to it's good it's very cathartic so if you haven't done it reach out to me i'd love to listen you know un poco de chisme verdad so um yeah she met, she met Sean okay and she said, you know, she never had a sexual relationship with Sean, okay? But um, she did have that connection with him, okay? So up to this point, you know, do you feel, who is the victim here? Who, who is the one that got, you know, I'll just tell you. It was Scott. <laughs> I'll just tell you. Um, yeah, so Scott ends up dying in this situation, okay? Now we're going to get there. We're going to get there, okay? So she meets Sean and... um. Sean talks to her. They don't have a sexual relationship, but they would go to the parking lot a few times, you know, maybe make out. Um, but honestly, to her, it was more just on the emotional level. So one day, um, Scott goes to her and tells her, you're a whore, you're a lying tramp. And she says, you know what? Let me pause you right there. And yeah, 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 I did finally meet someone. I finally met someone who is good to me and treats me well, who is nice to me and listens to me, and he likes me. He doesn't call me a whore or a tramp, and I like him. You know, oh, shit, shit got real. Uh, Scott loses it, and he's like, "Oh my god, how dare you!" I, el escaro, el escaro, nombre no. He was. Mm -mm, he was not having it uh -uh. he he said you know what you just done fucked up and now you're gonna come and get it okay you're gonna get it you know you fucked around and you're gonna find out and what is she gonna find out that he's gonna divorce her so yeah the next day scott man quick goes to the divorce attorney and files for a motion to divorce you know he's like hey i, I want to divorce this you know woman she's uh having an affair and I want full custody of my kids. And he comes to her and he tells her, Tracy, I'm leaving you. I filed for divorce. I'm filing for divorce. I'm taking the kids. And only you can see them every now and then. Supervised visits. And she was like, oh, hell no. Hell no. Sorry, my snap on this side is just not. It's just weak. She was like, oh, hell no. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. And I guess because she's a mom. She's like, these are my kids. I birthed them, you know. And carrying a kid for nine months man you know what i i feel like she's entitled to you know decide what happens to those kids three times for nine months damn she's a trooper so yeah she goes ahead and you know she's like i i want to discuss this um they eventually meet with the divorce attorney um and this is in a period of weeks so let's say this happened like the end of august por ahí, and you know september ish comes around they you know, they're discussing this and, you know, she, she, he's saying, I'm going to leave you, you know, and she's like, but you can't take my kids from me. They meet, they meet with the divorce attorney. Okay. And, um, they were arguing and it wasn't going well. Um, you know, he was adamant that he's going to take the kids from her and she can't see them except for supervised visits every now and then. And she's saying no. And he said, I'm going to use the fact that you, you are seeing Sean against you. And I'm going to prove to the court that you're an unfit mother. I'm going to know, like, don't come after your mom. Don't, you know, like, hey, she, she gave birth to those kids. Like, no, shit. Mm -mm. So the claws came out, right? They get home that night and they're discussing the, the custody situation. And she's telling them, look, we don't, you don't have to have full custody. And I don't have to have full custody. We can do joint custody. You know, we split the kids, you know, and. I have them every now and then. You have them every now and then. But this way that, you know, we both get to have access to the kids. I don't want to take complete access from you. And I don't think you should take access from me too. Like, they're my babies. I, you know, I am a good mom to them. And, you know, he was like, you know what, Tracy, you know, I, you're right. 
let's let's do that. Let's do joint custody. But honestly, I want to say mental health plays a big issue here because as soon as he said it, Tracy reports that he flipped the switch and he was like, you know what? I changed my mind. No, fuck this. I want full custody. You're a whore. You're a terrible mom. You know, you sleep around. You met someone new. I haven't met anyone. So because of that, I don't want you to have my kids. And there, it was a heated argument. And Tracy said, you know what? I don't need to put up with this shit anymore. I'm leaving you. So she grabs a bag and she starts packing it. And then, you know, Scott just like, oh, no, no. Dramatic AF. Dramatic AF. He starts crying. She says, like, he starts crying, you know, bawling. And, you know, he says, don't leave me. You know, I, 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 I love you. And, you know, so they calm everything down. Everything calms down enough, right? And se calman un poco. And, you know, they go to bed and Tracy has a routine, gets up every every day in the morning, you know, before she goes to work, um, goes and exercises for a while, whether it's a jog or a walk, she she goes and does that, you know, that's her routine, does about two miles, comes back home, you know, gets in the shower, gets ready for work and leaves, okay? So she gets, she comes home from her, from her uh, walk and se mete bañar, you know, she goes to get cleaned up and upon leaving the, the the shower or leaving the restroom um she hears like a, a groaning sound a, uh, a moan and she's like scott is that you and she goes and peeks on him and you know um sees that he's not responding you know she shakes his leg and no response so she gets closer you know, and I, I, I don't think the light was on in the room during this entire time. Um, I, I don't, I don't read anything about the light being on or off, but I'm assuming that the light's off because, um, you know, with, with the way everything was, you know, she shakes his leg and nothing. Well, she gets closer and she sees that he has a pillow over his face. And she moves the pillow and she sees that he's injured. Yeah. So he's injured, right? And she's like, hey, what what happened here? You know, honestly, excuse me, drinking some water here. Um, if I were in that situation, I wouldn't know how to react. I mean, I've been in situations where, you know, um, accidents have happened, you know, things have happened. And you're in a different state of mind altogether. Okay. Um, so I wouldn't know how I would react if I were to see that my husband of 20 some years has been shot in the head. Okay. I think I jump back, freak out, go, you know, uh, and I'd reach for the phone, call 911. And I mean, I'm not a nurse, so I, I don't know how to do CPR. Well, I mean, I know how to do CPR because um, I am certified or I'm supposed to be certified for work. Um, haven't been certified in the past, you know, a uh, few months because my certification has expired. Um, not because of, you know, it just work stuff. Right. Anyways. So I, I, I know how to provide CPR to an injured person, but you know, CPR is given to someone who is, um, not breathing. Okay. According to Tracy, Scott was still breathing at that moment, you know, he, she could see him still, and he was moaning, he was groaning, he's going, uh, you know, sound like a little, you know, like injured. Right. So, but first aid you, I am, I'm also certified in first aid and I feel like I could provide some sort of first aid, but again, I, I've, I've never been in that situation to do that. So I'm not sure. I mean, one time my dad cut his arm, you know, pretty big gash and, I mean, my dad had a problem where his blood wouldn't, you know, would, would be very thin and would struggle to clot because of the medications he would take um, for his, his condition. So I remember running to my room looking for a maxi pad for a pad, you know, um, and sticking it on his arm, you know, bandaging it, you know, put that there, grab the bandage tape, bandaged his arm. And I remember like, well, uh, I, I think after a while, like it started to clot somewhat, you know, cause I would check on it. Um, you know, but Hey, I mean, that, that was then one time I was outside putting up Christmas lights and a hammer fucking hit me in the head. And my, what was my reaction? It could, 
I swear I didn't go to the hospital. Instead, I turned ouch and put a bag of like peas or something on my head to like help the pain. And, you know, and I set an alarm on my phone every 20 minutes to keep myself from falling asleep because I knew I had a concussion. My eyes were red. That my head wouldn't stop hurting for a whole week. Very bad concussion, to be honest with you. Still took a final exam the next day and and uh, pretty much passed it. Um, but again, back to this, you know, if you're in that situation, you know, in emergency situations, you know, you don't necessarily think, you know, so calmly, but everyone's different. You know, I was calm when the hammer hit me in the head. I was in pain, I'll admit, but I was calm. I wasn't running around freaking out. You know, there was no visible blood, but, you know, a calmness was in me. So what did Tracy do? She calls him on one. And then she calls into work and says, I'm, I can't come in today. But remember, Tracy's a nurse, okay? So as a someone who works as, as a nurse, you know, I would feel that, yeah, you know, it's in your job description or, you know, to stay calm in an emergency situation. She was a labor and delivery nurse. She has to keep calm in an emergency situation. You never know when you have to switch from a vaginal birth to cesarean. And it's possible that that's, you know, why she would have such a calm mindset, right? So she calls him to work and says, hey, I can't come in. You know, um, I won't be coming in today at all. Hangs up, goes and wakes up her kids, tells them, let's go step outside. We need to wait for the ambulance. And they're like, what's going on, mom? Ambulance arrives. You know, paramedics rush inside. And again, Scott is still alive, okay? Tracy called it in saying that my, my husband has shot himself in the head. So she reported it as a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Police arrive. They're investigating what's going on. Um, se lo llevan. They take him to the hospital. And they're asking her questions, you know, what's going on them. And, you know, tell us what exactly, you know, happened. What were you doing? You know, why were you washing your hands at this moment? And she's like, well, it's because my kids are freaking out that I have blood on my hands. And, you know, did you provide CPR, ma'am? Well, no, because he's alive. So why am I going to provide CPR? You know? Um, and... Maybe she could have provided some kind of first aid, but again, you know, it's a gunshot wound to the head. What, how, how, how do you provide first aid without causing more damage? I know that there's, in when I've seen, um, like if you're in a car accident, sometimes they tell you don't move a person because if you move their head too much, you can cause more injury to them. So maybe that's what was going on in her mind. You know, I don't know. I, if, Tracy, if you're out there and you're listening to this, let me know. Was that was something that passed, you know, through your mind? Because I'm interested. I would really love to talk to you about this. So C, um, she goes ahead and she's like, hey, um, you know, I, I, this is what happened. Tells the police what's going on. Um, the entire time she's trying to get to the hospital, finally gets to the hospital. And they tell her, you know, um, we've officially declared Scott as brain dead. So they disconnected him from the machines and he dies that day. This happened October 15th, 2003. Okay. So, yeah, it it's pretty intense. And, yeah, maybe, you know, she was pretty calm. But, again, she works for as a nurse in the labor and delivery unit. You know, isn't that something you expect or want from your nurse? Someone who can stay calm in an emergency situation? I mean, I would. If I, if I go into the hospital, do I want to see my nurse freaking out? No, I'm already freaking the fuck out myself. You know, I like, no, I want you to be calm and keep me calm so we can stay calm together. You know, if I see my nurse going, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, you got some blood on you. Oh my God, oh my God. Well, I'm going to panic, you know, well, yeah, I have some blood on me. I mean, one time I fell at work, you know, uh, broke my toes and injured my leg. And what did I do? I went ahead and, you know, stayed calm and, you know, I got up from the floor and I walked to, um, I walked to, to my, to my office door and I let myself in with a punch card and I went ahead and, and, uh, spoke to my, I, I knocked on my supervisor's door and I said, Hey, uh, and he gives me like, you know, he, he looks up from his desk, but he was on the phone. So he just gives me like a, he waves me off with a finger, like, wait. And I'm bleeding. My leg is hurting. My toes are hurting. I'm, I'm, I'm cut up pretty badly because I felt pretty bad um, in the parking lot, mind you. So 
I'm in a lot of pain. And he kind of just waves me off like, wait. So I waited. And he finally opens the door. But at that moment that I'm waiting with him, um, someone sees me and they're like, oh my gosh, what happened? And mind you, I'm also covered in mud. <laughs> the, the, the parking lot was extremely muddy and that's how I fell. Um, you know, no one was upset at the parking lot, so no one helped me up. But I tried to stay calm because I was in a lot of pain and I wanted to, you know, not freak out. So I go and I, you know, someone sees me, what happened? I fell outside, I'm bleeding, you know, oh my gosh, are you okay? So they run and get me a chair. At that moment, my supervisor finally opens the door and he sees me. He's like, <gasps> and I see him panic. Okay. And he's all like, oh my God, oh my God, you know, I'm covered in mud. I'm, I'm bleeding. You know, I'm telling him I can't walk. My, my, my foot hurts. My toes are hurting. Um, you know, my ankle hurts. Like I'm in a lot of pain and he, he's like, okay, let me call Kobu. I'm like, no, 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 no. Don't call. Like, let me, let me get you some help. Like, no, all I wanted was to someone to help me back to my car. You know, I wanted to go get my, my laptop and everything from my, from my office. So I can be held back to my car and walk back to my car, you know, so I can dro- drive home and, uh, you know, tend to myself. I was in pain and I, I wanted to just go home. No, instead a ambulance comes for me and they take me off and, you know, it, it shows, you know, how like panicked he was, you know, seeing that situation. So yeah, if he were my nurse in a hospital, I wouldn't want to deal with him. He's running around kind of like a chicken without a head, you know, like, oh my gosh, let me, what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? And instead of saying, okay, you know what? Let's, let's stay calm. What's going on here? You need help walking back to your car. That's all I needed. That's all I needed. You know, they didn't do anything for me at the hospital. All they gave me was crutches and told me not to like carry anything heavy for about two weeks. And then from two weeks, it turned to about a month and a half because um, I had to go to, to, to therapy for my leg and stuff. <sighs> Get us with that. My toes are still damaged. Okay. <laughs> you know, panicking didn't help. So again, if as a, she's a nurse, yes, I want her to stay calm. So police were saying no, because she was, you know, too calm. Well, something must have, you know, must have triggered her to kill her husband. And all of a sudden turns from, you know, it's a suicide to it's a homicide, you know, she and she says i i she 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 will tell you i don't think i i uh don't know what happened i didn't kill my husband he shot himself you know and when she saw him yeah the the gun was in his hand you know but the people are just saying no 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 it it was you because you were too calm you called him to work you know uh, there was a puddle on the floor of blood and what did you do you kind of just like eyed the puddle and you must have picked up the gun put it in his hand and you planted it there you know but when they swapped his hands for or swapped her hands for gunpowder a residue she didn't have any and some some officers were saying well she was washing her hands when we got there and she says you know i was washing my hands because um my kids were freaking out you know they saw blood and they were you know well why do you have blood and according to some officers well you didn't provide cpr so why did you have blood and it could just be that you know he the pillow was bloody things are, might have been just bloody i mean we don't know i i didn't see the situation so you know said right but you know they they went off on her saying these are the reasons why you know the the pull of blood the the washing of the hands they didn't have she didn't have gun residue on her hands but um and the fingerprints were not on the actual gun her fingerprints were not on the gun but scott's were but they were saying that when they, they swapped Scott's hand for gun powder residue, um, it came out like, you know, inconclusive because his hands were had already been clean, but then his hands didn't have blood. So it could just be that his hands were cleaned off because of the situation. I don't know. You know, a lot of hands came in there because it wasn't initially, it wasn't a, a, a homicide. It, initially, it was an emergency situation and they were tra- trying to save this man's life. So, yeah, you know, things were moved around. To me, this case, you know, yes, justice needs to be served because someone's dead. But, you know, did she kill him? I don't know. I don't know. And, you know, only that's between her and Scott. Um, And if she says she's innocent, hey, I'm going to go with that, you know. But uh, nonetheless, she gets tried. You know, they go to take this case to trial. And um, they pushed that, yeah, you know, she did kill her husband. And 
if I, I don't know, I feel if I were the DA, I'd be like, nobody knows how to scare. You know, it too much stuff was moved around to have like a good case. You know, we're we're gonna. I honestly think that the reason they went forward with it was because they figure if they present enough, you know, some kind of evidence and present it to a certain type of people they could get away with confusing the people and say, okay, well, you know, they, they didn't know better and they, you know, will will confuse them enough to make them believe that this was going on. I don't know. I'm not saying it's a conspiracy, but cosas pasan, you know? Some, some lawyers are dirty and some judges are dirty too, okay? So because of that, you have to take into an account that maybe this is something they wanted to make a, a, um, you know, example out of, you know, let's make an example out of her that, you know, no se le disrespeta al hombre, you know, you don't disrespect the man. And they kind of push towards, you know, doing this, right? I don't know. I mean, what do I know? All I know is the facts that are presented in, you know, in articles and in my research that I've read, okay? So Tracy says, I didn't do it, okay? They take her to court and she was found guilty of first degree murder. And I mean, that's pretty intense. So the, to get to this part, you know, where she actually gets tried and stuff, it took two years for her to get, um, actually to become arrested. Um, they didn't arrest her until 2005, August of 2005, to be honest with you. Um, they were trying to, I guess, build up a case against her. Again, sorry, drinking some water here. Um, but they didn't actually start the trial for her until 2007. So they said, th- now, again, another reason why this they were kind of like going after her was because um, they alleged that she wanted to go off with Sean because, you know, she met him and they had a connection and they had found out about Sean. I think about 10 days after Scott's um, death, she meets up with Sean in a hotel. You know, according to her, it was just a talk. But, you know, I mean, you've talked in cars before, so why not a car? But, I mean, hey, maybe she wanted to the privacy to cry without people watching her and judging her. You know, it, it's, it, it could be. I'm not going to say it's, you know, it's all about sex. It could just be that. But yeah, they, they, the police found that, found out about that. And they're like, hey, let's use this against her. You know, we found out about the divorce, the custody issues, you know. So because of this, these could be reasons why you went after him to get rid of him. You wanted the kids to yourself. You wanted to a clean end to your, you wanted to end your marriage. So that way you, you may, you stage you to look like a suicide. So that way you can run off with a man and not have to worry about your husband or is it that scott is having some mental health problems and can't handle the fact that you know yes he's going to get a divorce from the love of his life he's been with him for 20 some years for 20 years there are three kids you know he's afraid to lose him he's afraid to lose her and he he kills himself i mean it could go either way it could go either way you know but police went with the whole, it's a love gone cold. You know, te cansaste del hombre, you got tired of your man, you found someone new, y te fuiste, you, you took off. So, like I said, she was found guilty. But um, what was the turn here is that when it came to sentencing, you know, the prosecution was going for life in prison. Okay. Um, and that probably could have, might've been which way they would have gone. But, you know, in the, in the actual trial, they heard testimony from Scott's family, from Tracy's family, and they heard testimony from the three boys. And jury came back three days after sen- for sentencing, right? And they said that um, they were convic- they were you know sentencing her to ten years probation. Big shock. I mean, in Texas, you know, Texas loves the death penalty. Texas, you know, man, that that's Texas for you. And I live in Texas, okay. So, 
yeah, I know how Texas is, and they love the death penalty. And any chance they'll hang you? I mean, not necessarily hang you, because I think it's uh, execution here. I mean, by uh, lethal injection. But nonetheless, you know, you just convicted a woman of first degree murder, and you're just giving her ten years of probation. I mean, whoa! You're basically her, basically letting her just walk the streets free. Now, her her conditions to the probation were she had an APM curfew, and you know she couldn't leave the county, and you know there were restrictions. Came, but nothing too bad, nothing nothing big and major, you know. But um, I know that she had lost her job in the in in the process, but I guess afterwards, you know, showing that she's only on probation, you know. Um, they were able to give her her job back and she continued living her, her life, you know, and, um, I know in one article I did read that she, um, was appealing it. And in the part of appealing, she ended up having to serve six months in jail. Um, and then she stopped her appeals because, because of that, and then still ended up finishing off the 10 years of probation. Um, but besides that, I know the only other time she served jail time was three days in jail while she was waiting the sentencing. Now, um, I mean, that's not bad. Ten years probation for killing, you know, a person. And again, we don't know if she actually killed him or not. You know, she says she didn't. And I'm going to go with Tracy on this one and say she probably didn't, you know. Um, and even if she did, I mean, women put up with a lot. So that, that hey. And honestly, I really don't think she, he, you know, she killed him. I, I honestly think it might've just been an actual suicide and it, a suicide gone wrong, I guess you could say. Um, but yeah, that's a story of Scott and Tracy, um, you know, jealousy rears its ugly head in the most awful of ways. And yeah, sometimes it just comes out late in the marriage, but it does happen. And Tracy was a trooper here for, you know, dealing with it when, you know, she could have easily just walked away or she could have walked away, you know, before this. Um, I mean, man, it, it, it's an intense case. And the thing is that I brought it up because it happened here in Bronzeville. And my coworker, um, the reason I know of it was because she knew one of the roadie boys. Um, I don't remember which one she says she knew, but she knew one of the roadie boys. And she told me, she's like, yeah, I went to school with him. And I remember when I was in school, when this happened and, you know, the sensation about it, you know, and I'm like, dude, where was I? <laughs> where was I in 2003 that I didn't hear about it? I mean, it could have, it could have been something that, that came out and I just didn't, I ignored it, you know, in 2003, different times, you know very different times than what we are in today i mean today i i open my phone and i get the news automatically 2003 i think i still read the paper and I, i'm not even sure i had the paper at that point either um nonetheless that's scott and tracy Rody, you know love gone cold um i know it's something different than normally what we talk about but i feel like it was something that kind of fit the valentine's day love theme you know they loved each other at one point um but it ended thoroughly so let me know what your thoughts are um if you follow us on uh spotify and um try to follow us on youtube too if you follow us on youtube look for us on spotify we also have an instagram we have a patreon um we have a tiktok and um if you go to galakaspod.com and we have a link to all our social media accounts there. So feel free to look for us. And remember, life begins after coffee. Thank you.